Hey guys, my name is Pedron, and I'm a professional practice assistant professor in finance. I'm also a CFA charter holder. This is another episode of my crash course in machine learning concepts, Simply Explained. All right, part 31. In this episode, we are going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of decision tree models in general, and we're going to explore some of the, the applications in finance. If you're watching this episode, I assume that you have already gone over part 28, 29, and 30. This means that I assume you're quite familiar with the definitions and decision trees. You know what's going on at the heart of each decision tree model, and uh, you know what do we mean by regression tree algorithm and classification trees, and what's the idea of pruning a tree, and what are the hyperparameters. And now you're ready to finally put everything together and say, okay, what are the advantages and disadvantages of decision trees and where and why we should use these models by looking at some applications in finance. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? Let's start with the pros. So the first one is there are decision trees are very easy to interpret and visualize, especially if the size of the tree is relatively small. So in the previous examples, both for regression and classification, we ended up with trees that are uh, relatively small and we saw that they are perfectly interpretable and it was easy to visualize them. So this is going to be a very important advantage of decision trees in general because if we care about interpretability of the models, this is, these are one of the best models out there. The next uh, advantage is going to be this one. The decision trees can easily handle categorical data without the need to create dummy variable. So this is going to become very, very useful and important. So let me give you an example. Imagine you're looking at a regression problem. You're trying to uh, predict what is going to be the price of the house, right? So, and your data is zip level data, zip code level data. So imagine this variable that you have in the data, it's zip code, and you're going to have 40 zip codes uh, data, right? And then you're trying to predict what is the price of a house based on some other features, right? So, you know, square feet, number of bedrooms, and etc. So if you want to think of this zip code, if you want to add, you want to add the zip codes in, in the feature space, you have to make it as a dummy variable because with the models that we have covered so far, there is no way to interpret that or actually to even think about the zip code if you don't make it as a dummy variable, right? So, however, for regression, for decision trees, we don't need to necessarily change them to dummy variable, right? So for example, we can have a decision node or internal node and the splits are going to be zip code, zip code number one, zip code number two, zip code number three, and etc. right? So we're going to end up with one categorical variable, which is zip, right? So in this very simple example, if uh, we want to, let's say we have x1, x2, and x3, these are the features. If uh, we want to work with a categorical variable, uh, we are going to end up with, let's say, four features, zip, x1, x2, x3. But if you have to create the dummy variable for categorical variables, we're going to end up with, let's say, 4D. Uh, let's keep all of them in the model. We don't need to drop one of them. So let's keep the 4D in the model. So we're going to end up with 43 features. So there is a huge difference between the two, right? So one model is dealing with four features, the other one, 43 features. And that's usually the case for in many applications out there. So usually if you want to use any model uh, rather than random forest or tree-based models in general, maybe you're going to end up with hundreds of features, but with a tree-based model, you're going to end up with a lot smaller and manageable number of features. So this is also a big advantage of decision trees. The next one is decision trees can easily capture nonlinear patterns. So in the data set that we saw already for baseball and player salary or for the classification, the data was nonlinear, right? So we had a box like this and we come up with a split and then there was another split here. So this is capturing the nonlinearity in the pa in, uh, nonlinearity pattern in the data, right? So by, so for example, we had, I don't know, we had years and number of hits here. So we started with uh, years and then went down the tree. And this uh, 
for example, here we had number of hits and etc. We can go down the tree. We can make more splits based on again, again based on years, or later on again based on hits. So as you can see, this nonlinearity is captured, is easily captured by decision trees, and this is also another advantage. Uh, another one is going to be the case that we know decision trees can handle data in its raw form. We don't even need to pre-process the data. And by pre-processing here, basically I mean maybe scaling the data, you know, feature scaling, standardization, normalization. And why? We do need to scale the features whenever we are calculating some sort of distance between observations, right? So for example, in KNN or in SVM, because we were doing, we were calculating the distance from observations, we had to pre-process the data. We had to scale the features. But for uh, decision trees, you know, we are not calculating any distance between observations. So we can, so that model can easily handle the data in its raw form. However, we know that if we pre-process the data, even for decision trees, it's not, it's not going to hurt. And finally, decision trees are non-parametric model. This means that we are not imposing any functional form or any assumption about making any assumption about the distribution of the features, right? Uh, so because simply the model is non-parametric. So what are the disadvantages? So the main disadvantage of decision trees is that it's poor level of predictive accuracy. And that's, that's the caveat of these models. So we really like all these advantages of decision trees, right? So we know that they are very useful. However, this the poor level of accuracy or predictive power is going to make us wonder what can we do about it, okay? So we have to extend the idea of decision trees. So let's see how we can do that. So that's the topic for future episodes, right? Another disadvantage is that the decision trees are sensitive to noisy data, right? They can overfit noisy data. It means that a small variation in the, in the data can result in a different decision tree. We can fix that. You know, this can be reduced by bagging and boosting algorithm. So let me give you a preview of the following episodes that in which I'm going to cover uh, three base models in general. So the idea is that we love these advantages of decision trees, right? They are, we know that they are very powerful models. At the same time, we don't like you know, poor prediction power. So we're going to say that, okay, how can we take advantage of uh, the, basically the pros and fix the caveat of the cons, right? So if you remember this error versus complexity graph, so here, the tree is going to become bushier and bushier as we go from left to right, right? So this was our bias square. This was our variance. And this is the total error, okay? So in decision trees, we are here. We are here, and then we use cost complexity pruning method to do something like this, okay? However, we're gonna say that, okay, why insist on working with single tree, right? Why, so why not take advantage of the wisdom of the crowd? So that's the idea of bootstrap aggregation. So in bootstrap aggregation, we're gonna, instead of working with one single tree, one weak learner, we're gonna ensemble these trees together. We call them ensemble methods. And with that, let's say having hundreds of bootstrap over hundreds of trees, you know, a forest of trees. With that, we are going to be able to mathematically reduce the variance, reduce the model variance. So we say, okay, let's start with this bushy tree. It's no problem, let's start with this bushy tree. But instead of pruning it back, let's the, the simulate, let's bootstrap over thousands of these trees, okay? And we, uh, by that uh, trick, we are able to reduce the variance. Okay? So this is how the concept of bagging is going to work, right? So the, the purple one is bagging. I'm going to talk about the details. This is just a preview for the future episodes, but I'm going to talk about the details uh, in the, the part 32 and onward. Okay? And uh, so that's the idea of bagging. What is random forest? Random forest is basically a subset of bagging, and basically it's going to reduce the variance even more by working with decorrelated trees. 
instead of working with a very bushy tree and go over hundreds of bootstrap on that, we're going to work with a subset of features, subset of the features in the, in the trees. And by that, we're going to decorrelate the trees. So this is a technique that is going to reduce the variance, decrease the variance even more effectively than bagging. So that's bagging. On the other hand, we have a set of a series of models which is called boosting. Let me see what color can I use. So let's say boosting. Let's use black. black. So in boosting, we're going to start with a small tree. Okay, we're going to small, start with a small tree and we're going to extend that trees on the residual of the model, right? So the idea is that we're going to expand that trees in a very clever way. By doing that, you're able to reduce the bias because the variance is already small. You're able to reduce the bias. So that's how the boosting method is going to work. So as you can see, the, by boosting and bagging, we can come around this poor level of predictive accuracy in decision trees. However, we're going to lose interpretability as well. So when we do boosting and bagging, because if we are dealing with hundreds of trees, it's, it's impossible to visualize them and we're lo losing that interpretability. All right. Okay, so let's wrap up this episode by going over some of the, the applications of decision tree models in finance. Uh, I want you to pay attention that we are going to use decision trees if we believe that th there is some nonlinear pattern in the data. And on top of that, if you're interested in that interpretability, in that visualization aspect of decision trees, because if you want to focus on predictive power of decision trees, we already know that there are better machine learning models out there, namely simply the tree-based models, right? So for example, random forest or boosting methods are going to easily outbid decision trees when it comes to uh, prediction accuracy, right? So we are going to use decision trees when we are interested in that interpretability aspect of the model. So let's look at some example. Imagine you're interested in generating consistent decision processes in equity and fixed income selection. So the key term here is consistent decision processes, right? Uh, that's that's the interpretability part of that. So we want to say, okay, so for example, what is the allocation between equity and fixed income? You want to look at someone's, you know, some of the client's uh, profiles and based on their pro profile, you want to say, okay, maybe 70% equity, 30% uh, yeah, fixed income. And among the equity class, so this is how you should uh, basically allocate uh, your funds to different equity investment classes, right? So actually, let me give you an example. Imagine we have an individual with, uh, with some features and this is our tree. So let's say age is going to become at the top of the tree. This is important. If age is greater than 60, so here we have no and yes. I'm going to go down one of the path and give you an example. Then other features that are important here, let's say we are talking about risk tolerance. So maybe risk tolerance can have three outcomes, right? Risk tolerance is high, risk tolerance is medium, and risk tolerance is low. And then after risk tolerance, maybe we are going to look at uh, the liquidity need, right? So maybe liquidity need has two uh, branches, liquidity need is high and liquidity need is low and so and we can again combine we can, for example age again can show up here but let's keep it very simple let's keep it let's say that we have a sequence like this if that's the case well what is your terminal load here say okay individuals with this profile this is just one path right with this profile maybe you should suggest them a safe, relatively safer asset because the risk tolerance is low, they are close to retirement age, they are not willing to you know, basically do take lots of risk, and etc. So for example, you're going to say that, okay, if that's the case, let's uh, recommend them 30-year third uh, third fixed income assets, right? And maybe, maybe 100% or a fraction of that is going to be investment in fixed income and the remaining in, the, in equity, right? So the idea is that we're going to come up with consistent decision processes. And as you can see, decision trees are going to be very perfect fit 
for uh, to deliver that uh, objective okay another example let's say you want to think of simplifying communication on investment strategies to clients again pay attention to this term simplifying communication of investment strategies again you want to sit in front of a client and explain to him or her that why you're specifically thinking of this investment strategies right so you want to make sure that you can communicate easily with them and then finally you can think of you know portfolio allocation problems right so this is we already talked about it in the first example but specifically imagine you have a portfolio portfolio of equity and you want to invest in different indices right based on different factors so how how you are going to explain it to the clients that why you did why do you selected this portfolio allocation so in all these three examples that i listed here you see a common pattern the pattern is that you want to explain these uh, you want to basically use uh, take advantage of that interpretability aspect of decision trees right you want a model which is explainable easily you can communicate with clients and explain them what's going on so decision trees are perfect fit for that kind of problem all right this is the end of our discussion in uh, for decision trees in the following episodes we're gonna start with the idea of bootstrap aggregation and then we're gonna expand it to boosting until the next episode take care